This is a packet of crisps from Sainsbury's. Mmm, very nice out too. This, however, is a packet of crisps from Mark Spencer's. They're still crisps, but they come this slightly, shall we say, perceived higher quality because they're from Mark Spencer's. A bit more middle class, dare I say. Mmm, very nice. Now, if you were Sainsbury's and you wanted to change people's perception of your badge, of your name, if you will, how would you do it? How would you compete with Mark Spencer's? Well, you do this. You bring out something called Taste the Difference and you charge a little bit more for it and put it in a slightly posher bag. Mmm. Now, you're competing with Marks and Spencer's because the badge doesn't really mention Sainsbury's on it. It's labelled as Taste the Difference. It has a nicer sort of product wrapping in it and therefore you can charge a little bit more but give more value for money because it comes in a bigger bag for the same price. Hmm. But let's change those names of Sainsbury's and Marks and Spencer's to Ford and Audi. If you're Ford, what do you do to take on the might and prestige of Audi? Well, you delve into your back catalogue and you bring out one of the most iconic names that you own. Mustang. Welcome to this week's twin test, welcome to the Audi Q4 e-tron, welcome to the Ford Mustang Mach-E and welcome to Auto EV. Now, before we go on to this week's twin test between the Q4 e-tron and Mustang Mach-E, it is of course that time where I ask you to like the videos, subscribe to the channel and press the little bell button that's just down there so you'll receive notification of when our next video goes live. Now, both of these cars suffer from a little bit of an identity crisis. You see, unlike its big brother, the e-tron, this has got a Q prefix that Audi gives to all its other SUVs, i.e. the Q4 e-tron. But does that lessen its appeal? Does that diminish its existence within Audi's range? Well, no, not at all. You see, this is based on Volkswagen's MEB platform that we've already seen cars such as the ID3, ID4 and Skoda Enyaq spun off. This is a really important car for Audi. In fact, they see it as becoming its second biggest selling car in its range. So it's important that they get it right. And that's before we get to the elephant, or should I say horse, in the room. Has there ever been a more divisive name to put on an SUV than Mustang? Have Ford got it right? Have they sullied the name of their iconic brand by putting it on an all-electric SUV? Well, we're hopefully going to find out today. Now we'll start with the newer of the two cars, which is the Audi, and it's, well it's an Audi SUV, you're not going to mistake it for anything else, but, but it's nice and it's well proportioned car, um, it's got the kind of familiar trapezoidal Audi grille that isn't, there's no grille there, cooling down the bottom, e-tron badging there, this particular car has some really fancy matrix LED lights, but that's an option. Now we'll come on to options later when we do pricing um, for the cars. There's a couple of little disappointing bits. There's fake vents here that aren't really needed. Um, there's got a bit, a bit of plastic around the front. It's a bit safe, but that's Audi these days. It's nice, it's well proportioned, it's inoffensive and round the side, the well-proportioned shape continues. I actually think it's slightly better looking than its big brother stablemate, the full-size e-tron. You've got this kind of bluff front end, these nice swollen wheel arches front and rear that bring me in mind of the original 80s R Quattro, if you're old enough to remember those. Um, this particular car is optioned up on the 20-inch wheels, but the range starts with 19s, but you can go up to 21 inches depending on the spec. The other thing I'm really glad that Audi has done away with is they've abandoned the, the cameras on these, the rear-facing cameras, and stuck to this innovative, innovative solution here with a mirrored piece of glass. Ooh, fantastic. Love to see that. And around the back, well, it's as you'd expect to find it. It's nice, it's neat, it's well-designed. Of course, it's got a light bar that's um, de rigueur for electric SUVs these days. You can get the Q4 e-tron with the more kind of rakish sport back as well, much like its larger e-tron sibling. 
And also interestingly, Volkswagen are going to do a similar thing to the ID4 and but call it the ID5. And Skoda are also rumoured to be doing a coupe version of the Enyaq. Which brings me neatly on to a question: is this a better looking car than the Enyaq? I think it's better than the ID4, if I'm honest with you. But the Enyaq, well, I'm not so sure. This is quite a kind of subtle spec that we've got here, but you can go quite wild with the colours and the wheels. But let us know what you think in the comments. But crucially, is it a better looking car than the Mustang? Now, the Mustang. Have Ford over egg the pudding? Have they tried to include too many styling cues from their coupe pony car into this an SUV body style? And has it worked? Well, I think it has. I don't think they have done too much. I absolutely love the way this car looks. I love this sort of like filled in kind of area at the front that's shaped like the grill, but isn't a grill. It's just got this bizarre Mexican moustache around it. Hmm. Anyway, down at the bottom, you've got flaps that open and close depending on the cooling and these beautiful kind of cold swept back headlamps that remind me of the traditional coupe and these lovely powered bulges in the bonnet. It looks muscular, it looks like a Mustang should, but without using too many pastiches. And round the side, it's a similar story. I love this design trick that they've done here, where they've painted this higher roof section black so that it looks like the kind of sloping back of a traditional 67 Fastback. It's a really clever styling trick without giving away any interior space on the car, but it all looks a bit hunkered down and the way the kind of front wings curve and you know, it's got slightly smaller wheels on this car, that's the only thing. I think they look better with slightly bigger alloys and maybe in a slightly more attention-grabbing colour. It works quite well. But the whole thing's nice and neat and really... Yeah, I mean, as I say, it's got enough of a family resemblance to the Mustang without just, you know, sullying its name. The only thing I'm not so 100% sure of is these buttons here. There's no door handle, it's an electric button release. And you've got a keypad option where you can lock and unlock it by using a cord on the side. And I just think maybe on colder and frostier mornings, I'm not sure whether they're going to be any good and how long they'll actually work for. Would it have been too hard just to give us a normal handle Ford? Really? Anyway, on the whole, I think it really works. And round the back, well, again, it's identifiable as a Mustang. You've got this lovely sloping back end here, dropping into these three bar lights that you would get on the coupe version as well. You'll also notice there's no Ford badges on the car, save for one at the top of the windscreen. All the other badges on it are the Prancing Pony here. Now, what do you think? Has Ford sullied the name? Is it trying too hard to sort of like draw sort of like styling cues in from the coupe? Let us know in the comments down below. In terms of styling between the two, choosing between them, the Audi's a little bit more safe, a little bit more school run, whereas the Mustang's a little bit more sporty, a bit more quarter mile run. Let's call it a draw this time, shall we? Now, both cars are obviously family SUV crossovers, so they've got to be practical. But it's here that Audi is the more practical, with a boot space of 520 litres, as opposed to the Mustang's 402. You can extend both cars by folding the rear seats down, and both have a 60-40 split rear seat, although oddly no ski hatches or three-way splits on the seats like some of their rivals do have. But even so, the Audi will go up to 1,490 litres, whereas the Ford is 1,420. But where the Mustang does counter is it does have a front boot where you can either store the cables or you can take out the dividers and have an additional 81 litres of space. So it's fairly close in terms of overall space, but in reality, it is the Audi that is the more practical of the two. Now, oddly... The sportback version of this has actually got a slightly bigger boot than the, the full-size e-tron at 535 litres. I'm not quite sure how that works. But either way, all of our cases, a uh, cabin bag, medium suitcase and large suitcase fit with ease with plenty more room to spare. The Audi is a little bit better off finished in the back because it's got this nice like rigid load cover Whereas the Ford has this fabric parcel shelf a bit like the Lexus UX300e that we tested and I have to say I don't 
really like it. It just kind of gets in the way and we've got luggage that kind of pulls it up. And if I'm being honest, the clip fell apart with me this week. What I will say about the Mustang, however, is the rear seat back folds flat onto the squab. The squab doesn't fold on either car, but it's the Mustang that has the low, the sort of like the flatter load bay area when you've got the rear seats down. Okay, let's talk about rear seat space. And both cars, as I say, benefit from being a ground up full EV platform. There is loads of space in either car. Um, I've got good um, space. This is the rear of the Mustang. I've got good leg footroom. My feet can get under the, the, um, the front seats. There's a flat floor in both cars. This particular Mustang has the technology pack fitted, which gives it this stunningly big panorama glass roof which I absolutely love and it floods a lot of light into the cabin as well as this having this sort of like lighter headline I think works really really well and um, headroom for me is fine I think if you were maybe a little bit closer to the six foot mark you might find it a little bit tighter in here but otherwise it's okay storage is okay you've got door pockets on either side although they are a little bit shallow and they're not particularly well lined and we've got a folding armrest with a couple of cup holders um, you've got a USB and USB-C charge port back here. Nice little mat pockets on the backs of the front seats and obviously face vents. And there's two Isofix points, one and obviously on either side of the car. So how does the Audi fare in comparison? Well, again, really well. There is plenty of space back here. You do feel a little bit more enclosed because obviously you don't have the glass roof and it's a dark headlining in this particular car. So it feels a little bit more claustrophobic. But in terms of actual overall space, it's not that way at all. Again, legroom. I've got absolutely stacks of it. Feet can get underneath the front seats. I've got some really deep, nice big deep door bins. I've got another... Um, bottle holder in each door as well and um, again map pockets on the backs of the seats we've got air conditioning controls in the back of the Audi whereas we don't in the Mustang you've also got the two USB charging ports plus a 12 volt socket in the back of this one as well um, the only thing is no fold down armrest that's the only black mark but it counters by having these bottle holders in the door so I'd say it's a narrow victory to the Audi. I'd just love to see it feel less claustrophobic in the back, but in terms of space, victory Audi. Apart from the name, probably the most controversial aspect of the Mustang is this interior. So let's have a chat about it. It's dominated by this Tesla-like 15 and a half inch screen, which is in portrait mode rather than landscaping up on top of the dashboard. And I'm sort of, split a bit my opinion of it if I'm honest with you the problem I have a little bit with it is it hides quite a nice design of dashboard they've designed the dashboard like the kind of twin cowl style of the original Mustang and then they've hidden it by putting this here and it looks like a sort of like a, a huge iPad Pro stuck on a face vent mount but it does work quite well. It runs off Ford's Sync 4 operating system and it gives over the air updates so the car's always got the latest um, systems fitted and you've got real time navigation and it works with um, wireless uh, Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, which I think is brilliant. The other nice things about it is the heating and ventilation controls are always on at the bottom. So irrespective of what you're looking at up here, this is always the heating and ventilation controls and they're on all the time. You don't have to go in and find them. They're there, they're nice and easy. And of course, you get this sort of like embedded volume rotary control, which is, which is great, works really well. But it's a less cohesive design than some cars we've seen. Now, the secondary screen is this 10-inch dashboard display, which does work really, really well. And it does give you all the information that you need as a driver. So you've got this rather um, natally um, uh, named speedometer as ground speed, which is here. Your gear indicator here. And then obviously there's a, a, a an indicator of where the car is. And if you're using your active um, 
uh, radar guided cruise control it'll tell you how close you are to the car in front and if you're using lane keep assist it'll also show you on here and if you've got navigation up then it will show you the little configuration on this side and your range is always on display here so that works really really well the only downside is unlike the id4 that moves with the column that's fixed to the actual dashboard but the design of it and the clarity of it is nice what's the rest of the interior like well it's okay actually it's a little bit um, there's good and bad with it as I say this particular car is fitted with the technology pack now that gets the big panorama sunroof it gets the 360 degree um, all round camera it gets assisted power tailgate um, lift um, it's got other things like um, smartphone mirroring, app link whatever that is and a host of other things but the rest of the cabin it's nice, it's airy it's got good storage I've got a couple of cup holders bottle holders here we've got a nice flat tray here with wireless charging for my mobile i've also got a usb and USB C port in there there's also another area underneath this console for more storage you've got the rotary dial um, transmission uh, control here an electronic park brake this particular car's got the Bang & Olufsen sound system fitted which gives it the speaker the full width of the dashboard and then on the door cards as well I've got more storage in here I've got a 12 volt socket uh, plenty of room in the door bins I've got electrically adjustable seats in this car as well which are um, trimmed with the, the I think they call it Centrica leather they're they're quite soft, they, they're, they're very luxurious feeling, they're good for a long drive with nice under thigh support. But what I will say is they don't give the same lateral side support that you get in the Audi, that's the only downside. They're heated as well in this particular car, which is controlled through the screen. It's also got a heated steering wheel. The wheel itself, it's a nice size, you get a good driving position in the car. There's electric seats in this one, as I say, with three position memory. The one thing I will say, this is better than the Audi for having the actual physical controls on the steering wheel. You'll see this on the Audi. For some odd reason, they've gone to the sort of like the touch sensitive buttons on the steering wheel that Volkswagen have. And they're t just too easy when you're turning or when you're uh, holding the wheel to hit a button with the heel of your hand. Whereas on the Ford, you don't really get to do that. But yeah, it's, as I say, it's a real mixed bag in here. As I say, I quite like some of this. But there's other bits of it I'm not 100% sure of. I'm still making my mind up and I have spent a huge amount of time in the Mustang this week. Build quality is okay. That's the only other negative I would say in terms of a car that's at the price of the Audi. The build quality in some parts like here is fine. But on this door card, there's just a bit too much given it for my like on a, what is a £52,000 car. But don't, let that sway you because as I say there's a lot to recommend the interior of the Mustang and talking of the Audi well it's like the outside it's familiar Audi which is to say it's neatly designed it's beautifully built and everything's quite familiar if you've been used to anything from Audi in the last like five or six years apart from this slightly odd sort of squared off steering wheel which I don't particularly like but that's a £285 option so I'd probably leave that one in the options list and as I said when I was in the Mustang the only other thing I don't like about it is these touch sensitive buttons on the steering wheel which are all too easy just to knock with your hand and either move your radio station or make a phone call or something if you're moving around the wheel but other than that it's actually a really really nice interior Audi have stuck with nice big clear physical buttons down here for things like the air conditioning controls the heated rear seats the other nice thing that's got as well is this like the audi e-tron gt is this lovely little scroll wheel for the volume of the radio and track search or station search i really like that it reminds me of the first generation ipods with a the click wheel and it's really easy to use the transmission is this nice sort of like little lozenge style lever here that we saw on the Skoda and like the Ford there is bags of storage you've got big area down in there I've also got wireless charging pad in here for my mobile the car also features wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto 2 um, normal kind of column stocks you know you've been used to the air vents are all nicely designed in there of particular note is these great lovely door mounted bottle holders right at the top of every door 
where you just stick a water bottle in. Really clever idea, it just drops in there, really easy to hand. I've also got two cup holders here. Again, like the four, I've got a center armrest storage down in there. Um, you know, good size glove box on both cars, door bins on either side. So it, it sort of follows a very, very similar theme. Um, as I say, to sort of the outside. It's all familiar Audi. There's nothing in here to frighten you. The touchscreen um, infotainment system is as, as we've seen before. Another thing I like about it is you get the nice, the click when you press it to let you know you've actually pressed something. And then also as well, you've got Audi's virtual cockpit. So you can change the view on here, depending obviously on what you want, whether you want the full map view, um, no map view at all, just have dials up, um, or whether you want the sort of like the shrunken, the shrunken dials to have a bigger map up here in your infotainment there. So you, there's more of a sort of like a scope to configure it as to see how you, how you feel comfortable with it. The seats, as I say, are, are, are slightly better than the Fords in the sense they've got more lateral side support um, and you've also got the adjustable squab. They're not bad in the Ford in terms of under thigh support for me, um, but you know maybe for taller drivers they might struggle, but at least you can adjust it in the Audi. The quality, as I say, is what stands apart from the Ford, whereas the Ford bring something new to the party in the way it's designed and a lot of the integration of its technology, the Audi doesn't. But the Audi counters by just having that slightly better feel of quality about it. Yeah, it's a, it's another draw here, I'm afraid. Now, the Mustang Mach-E comes with two battery sizes, either a 68 kilowatt hour usable size, giving a range of either 273 miles to the WLTP cycle in rear wheel drive form or 243 miles in a WTP cycle in all wheel drive form. The car I have is the larger, the Mach-E extended range, which gives an 88 kilowatt hour battery, which will give a range of 379 miles in rear wheel drive form like this one, or 343 miles in all wheel drive, uh, guys. Charging speeds will also vary depending obviously on what battery size you have as well. And um, so if you've got the smaller of the two battery, it will take charging speeds of up to 115 kilowatts. Or if you have the larger battery, it will be able to take a charging rate of up to 150 kilowatts, meaning your charging speeds from 10 to 80% is either going to be 38 minutes or 43 minutes, depending obviously on the battery. Topping them up to full is obviously overnight. Now, much like the Mustang, the Q4 e-tron also is available in two battery sizes, either the 52 kilowatt hour battery, um, which would give a range of around about 208 miles on the WLTP cycle. Now, that's down on power as well, so that would only give 170 PS in power. We've got the larger car here with rear wheel drive, the 77 kilowatt hour battery car, which goes up to 204 PS in terms of its power, and it gives a WLTP range of 360 miles so it's it's down on the Mustang but in real world terms they're probably going to be a little bit closer because as we know they never really achieve exactly what the manufacturers say in terms of their actual ranges charging speeds do vary again depending on the battery size so the smaller battery will take speeds up to 100 kilowatts whereas the larger battery will take speeds of up to 125 kilowatts so the Mustang that we have here is the rear wheel drive one. You can get it with all wheel drive, um, but it's the rear wheel drive one that we have here. And the Audi 2, by the way, is also going to be available with um, its signature Quattro drivetrain. But let's concentrate on what the Mustang is actually like. And is it sporty enough to wear the badge? Well... Yes and no. Look, it's got 296 PS, but it's quite a heavy car. I mean, 296 PS, well, that's quite a bit of power. Not to 60 is dispatched in six, uh, seven seconds. Now, that used to be pretty brisk for a hot hatch. Nowadays, it's about middling, really, for even an EV sort of like SUV. I mean, the, the Kia e Nero, um, which has a lot less power than this dispatches it in a similar type of time. So why is that? Well, it's quite a big car. It's bigger than the Kia Nero and it's a little bit heavier. Let's remember, these cars are not what you'd call featherweights. 
you know, you're looking over two tonnes for this car. What Ford have done, however, is that they've kept the weight really low in the chassis, so all the batteries are nice and underneath there. So it doesn't feel top heavy, it never feels like it's, you know, its body roll is quite well in check. But what they've also done to sort of counter the weight of the batteries low down is from the suspension up. And that means that its ride quality at low speed is quite jiggly. It's not as composed a ride as I was sort of expecting it to be. It's not uncomfortable, don't get me wrong. It's not an uncomfortable ride quality at all, but you do notice pretty much all the surface imperfections. And that's a little bit of a shame. The other downside is the steering. It is quite light, it's quite light and it's quite vague. Now I know it's not a sports car, I know that, but Ford made a big thing. We were at the launch of the car in London last year and they were making a thing that they sort of like said their benchmark for this car was their own Mustang. Well, I'm not sure whether that was maybe just something that they've said to appease a lot of people who were saying, well, why, should it, why have you called it a Mustang? But yeah, it's not a sporty drive in the same sense that the Mustang Coupe is. Now that might change with the Mustang GT, with the mach -E GT, the, the all singing, all dancing, nigh on 500 horsepower model that's coming online later this year. That could possibly change then. But for now, those are the two areas where I feel the dynamics are a little bit let down. It's low speed ride, and it's slightly light and vague steering. But the rest of it, the rest of it is quite nice. You get a nice view out of the car. You sit well. As I say, the Audi seats are slightly better in terms of holding you in a lateral support type of way. But on the whole, it's not, um, it won't disgrace itself. I've just done pretty much 700 miles in this car in a week. And um, it's been, it's been a lovely car to spend some time in. It's brisk, it's not quick, going back to the, 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 um, the, sort of the performance of it. Now you get three drive modes with the Mustang Mach-E. You get Whisper, um, which turns everything off and keeps it really nice and serene. It doesn't dial down on the air con or anything like that, but it just numbs everything down that little bit, makes the car feel much more um, relaxed. You get active, which is sort of the, 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 the mode that I've had it in for the most time, which is sort of, I suppose, like everyone else's normal mode, um, where there's a little bit of sharpening up of things. And then you get untamed. Yeah! I think it's called unbridled in the US, but over here we get untamed. Now you go into these via the screen, obviously. You go into drive modes. Active is the one I've got it set up for, but whisper. But if I go untamed, then the, like, the display changes and it shows me some slightly odd kind of bars that come onto the, the screen here and it pipes in, or it's supposed to pipe in engine noise into the cabin. Not really sure that we need that, if I'm honest with you. There it is. There we are. And it sort of beefs everything up a little bit and makes the throttle response a little bit sharper. So it does do something. It does do something. It's a little bit gimmicky, I'll give you that. You know, it's all right. Let's go back to active for a bit. There we go. Um, brakes, let's talk about the brakes. The brakes are good. The brakes are really, really nice on the car. It's a bit like the Porsche Taycan um, in its standard setting. It's designed to coast to give you maximum efficiency. So when you um, come off the, the throttle pedal, there's no brake regeneration. The car just coasts along. And that's been great um, using it up and down the motorway uh, this week. You can flick, there's a little button on the middle of the rotary dialer here, L, and then when you press that it comes up on L, that's the car with its brake regen on now. So it's a bit like the Audi that has the B 
button like the, the Skoda has and a lot more people have you can't adjust the level of regeneration from there on in it's just either sort of on or it's off but you can set it up to have a one pedal drive where it really that's the maximum so it's a bit like the Tesla in that sense so you can have L for like its first level of regeneration where it's quite um, quite tame or you can go into one pedal driving where it really comes off the pedal there's no paddles to adjust it that's it so how does the Audi drive in comparison well I used to use an old expression that if it looks like a duck quacks like a duck flies like a duck and swims like a duck chances are it's going to be a duck so something that looks like an Audi is built like an Audi it's probably going to drive like an Audi and it does that's exactly what it does which is to say it is very quiet it's very smooth it's very refined but it's not exciting and again I, I get that these aren't sports cars but there's nothing here that there's nothing to scare you but there's just nothing to really you know delight either so this is the the higher of the two power ratings that's available on the q4 e-tron at the moment this is the one that's just over 200 horsepower it's 204 ps i think um which is down in the mustang uh, you know and as i say it's you know none of these cars are particularly light cars so it's not exactly bursting with performance there is going to be more powerful versions available and there's you're able now to order the the four wheel drive the 50 um e-tron 50 quattro i think as it's it's known but don't order it thinking that it's going to be some kind of porsche macan turbo um rival or anything like that because it, it certainly isn't what it is though as i say is a very refined and very quiet car i mentioned before the seats they are better than the mustangs in terms of lateral support um, there's a bit more side support in them so they are quite nice this way this particular car being the sport it uh, doesn't have leather as standard it's just got the cloth trim but i don't mind that so much actually um, the seats themselves they're, they're not quite as soft as the mustangs um, but they are very supportive so that's quite nice the ambient noise that comes from around the car is probably a little bit less there's a slight rustle from believe it or not the wing mirrors which is the one thing i commended audi for fitting to them um, you get a little bit of wind noise just round about here but otherwise there's not a lot of other sort of like noise makes its way into the carbon apart from a little bit of suspension pattern i'd say probably not quite as loud as the mustang but it's still noticeable you still do get, it's not as well isolated as something maybe say as a, as a Kia e Nero or the Lexus the Lexus UX 300e that I think is one of the most beautifully refined um, EVs that I've driven I think it is stunningly quiet on the inside of that car but the rest of it as I say is okay and if you approach it as being okay then you're not going to be disappointed whatsoever there is albeit it's a rear drive chassis there is a tendency to lose front end grip um, over anything else so it does understeer that's tight you know in sort of like extremes when you're really getting a bit of a hustle on but i drove this car the mustang and the mercedes in the millbrook proving ground as i mentioned and on the hill route you could feel the the, the audi just just losing that front end bite before the other two but as i say that's in extremes no one's really going to be putting them through that type of pace and if you are then data suggests you probably bought the wrong car um the steering's nice it's got a nice feel to it as i say i don't particularly like this particular this particular steering will fit it to this car but it is an option it's not particularly comfortable to hold um i don't really like the shape of it albeit it does make you know it does make the dashboard visibility very good um throttle response is fine now that depends obviously on the driving modes um that you go into um because there are uh, there are a few you can actually choose from and they are selected by a button 
just down on the center console down here you go into drive select and it comes up on the touch screen i've got efficiency comfort auto dynamic or individual where you can obviously program your, your, your own sort of like settings into and each one has a, a degree of a varying degree of sharpness or dullness to it depending obviously on what you want um, the brakes are worthy of a mention again they're not they don't feel quite as wooden as the ID4s um, I know that was an area of controversy with me mentioning the idea I thought the ID4s brakes were particularly bad um, there's a few of you commented on that but it's okay, they're okay, they're not as sharp as the Mustangs, but because they're not quite as sharp, it means you can be a little bit smoother on them. Um, you've also got regeneration available here. Now, it's got this little lozenge, as I say, gear selector like you had in the Enyaq, and it's when it's in D, you pull it back to another setting when you're in B. Um, and when you go into B, you can then vary the degree of regeneration that you get via these two paddles behind the steering wheel which is quite nice because you can tailor it obviously how you um, how you want it and how you see fit um, and you can get pretty aggressive or you can really slacken it off depending on how you like it what is worthy of mention is the head up display um, that we get here you don't get it in the Mustang you get a nice head up display here the more and more of these that I use the more and more that I'm starting to really like them because especially, I think I've mentioned it before, when you're, when you're going into sort of like little villages and such things, you know, where you've got maybe sort of like tighter roads, it's nice just to have that speed limit sign displayed right up in your line of sight and your speedometer there. So it's easy just to have a quick glance at it. So I really do like the head up display you get in the Audi. Other things of note are just the layout of the cabin as i say it's typical audi you can find everything really easily everything's really easy to hand um it works really well um it's you know when you press it you know even the screen it clicks as i mentioned um so you know that you've actually you know touched the um you've activated whatever it is you're selecting i really like that that's really um good don't as i say i'm going to mention it again i don't like these touch sensitive buttons on the steering wheel i think they're a absolute waste of time i prefer to see physical buttons but you don't have those fiddly slider controls that you had on the volkswagen and the volume control on the skoda how does the ride go well the ride's okay actually as i say you can feel or you can hear the, the pitter patter there of the kind of broken surfaces but the body control and the ride of the car is actually quite good i quite like it it's not as um it's not as jarring over certain surfaces as the mustang so it is a little bit more comfortable and as i say it, it makes for a more kind of refined drive it's as i say you can hear it but you can't really feel it which is more about the sound deadening rather than the actual suspension and chassis itself the steering's okay it's not as light as um, the Mustangs it's got a little bit more of a, a kind of meaty feel to it but again it's not a point and squat car and it's there's a vagueness around about the dead ahead nothing nothing worryingly so but just not quite as doesn't have something like a real nice kind of turn and as you get in some of the other EVs but on the whole it is going back to my original statement a typical Audi it does the job and it does it really really well it's just you know I, you, you, you don't grab the keys and go out for a drive in this car for the sake of driving it you don't go you don't think to yourself well I'll take the longer way home you know because it's a fun car to drive that may change as more variants come on I don't know but I always find with manufacturers, when they put the sport badge on something, you're kind of setting yourself up for a fall if it doesn't drive in a sporty way. Maybe they should have called it an AC or something like that rather than sport. But on the whole, it's okay, it's fine. 
Now, why neither of these cars are applicable for the UK's plug-in car grant? Because they both start at over £40,000. Now, the Audi, the Q4 e-tron range, starts from just over £41,000. And the choice of trim levels you have is Sport, S-Line Edition 1 or Vorsprung. The range will continue way into the mid 50s, depending obviously on what you specify and um, in terms of trim and options. The car we have here is a sport model, um, which starts at just over £44,300. But actually this car on the road with the options that it's got at time of test comes in at just over £52,000. Now the Mustang similarly starts from around about £41,000 but this is the extended range uh, rear wheel drive version I have here and with the options fitted to this particular car it's very similar to the Audi at just over £50,000. The range will be topped by the new Mackie GT which is its 480 brake horsepower performance derivative which is going to cost over £60,000 when it arrives on UK shores late 2021. Now as we know this is a real hotbed of talent this particular area of the market sector and there's more still to come. We've already seen Volkswagen's ID4 and we know that its coupe sibling the ID5 is about to hit the shores. So does Enyaq, a car that we really do rate, that's available in this market sector depending obviously on trim and options and it's worthy of consideration. The Koreans, the Hyundai Ioniq 5, the Kia EV6, if past is anything to go by, those two are going to be real contenders in this market space. And from Volvo, we've already seen the XC40 in, well, quite highly specified and expensive T8 recharge form, but it's also going to become available in smaller battery capacities and lower power and, crucially, cheaper price, bringing it squarely in line with these two. Nissan's Aria, another car we're looking forward to, that's going to offer a huge amount of space, some great battery technology at a really competitive price. And also from Japan, albeit it's not quite as talented, but it is still worthy of your consideration, is the Lexus UX300e. And the one car I haven't mentioned yet, well, that's the Mercedes-Benz EQA, the car we're going to be testing next. So I wouldn't place your bets just yet. So here's what we like and what we don't like about the Ford Mustang Mach-E. We like its styling. Its range in extended range form. It's well equipped. Good storage in the front of the cabin and its infotainment system. We don't like the low speed ride is a bit firm. The steering is a little bit numb and vague. Some of the interior design is a little incohesive and there are still areas of build quality that don't seem justified on a £50,000 car. And here's what we like and what we don't like on the Audi Q4 e-tron. We like its styling, the interior space, and its build quality. We don't like it can get expensive depending on trim level and options fitted. The handling is a little bit vague. And its interior styling, whilst well built, does play a little bit safe. So, have Ford done it? Have they, first of all, done enough to convince you that this is worthy of the Mustang badge? And second of all, have they done enough to convince you that it's every bit as good as an Audi Q4 e-tron? Well, let me start by saying this. The Audi is a superb car. In fact, it's so good, I prefer it to the larger e-tron because it gives every bit as much space inside. It's as well built, it's as beautifully designed, and it does everything slightly more efficiently for a lower price. Its downside, however, is you can apply those same thoughts to the Skoda Enyaq, which is cheaper than the Audi, and is based on the same mechanicals, and is more roomy inside, and, depending on trim and spec, is a little bit cheaper. But that's not really what we're asking here is, is the Mustang better than this? This is a very flawed car, very flawed. It's not perfect, in fact, it's far from it. But I'm filming this on a Tuesday afternoon, and last Thursday, I had to go to Scotland and come back yesterday. Which car did I choose? 
I didn't choose it because it did a bigger range. I chose it because it interests me more. Those flaws, that character, is what makes the Mustang. It's exactly the same as the Mustang Coupe. We love a flawed character. My head says Audi, but my heart says Mustang. But don't place your bets just yet, as I say, because next week we're gonna be testing the Mercedes-Benz EQA, another sub 50,000 pound compact crossover with a premium badge on the front. So let's see what we think after that. But in the meantime, it remains for me to say thank you for watching. And as always, please remember to like and subscribe to the channel, pressing the little bell button down below for notification of when our next video goes live. And also remember to head over to autoev.co.uk where you will see our back catalogue and library of road test reviews and all the latest news from the EV world. Thanks for watching. See you again soon. So, you've watched our video. It's now my job to tell you to like and subscribe and press the little bell button to receive notification of when our next video is uploaded.